Welcome. Uh, I'm Giovanni Zenalta, the director of the Duke Center for Unitation and Global Studies, and uh, I'm welcoming all the uh, attendees to our uh, first webinar of the spring semester, even though the spring semester will start on the 20th. This is an anticipation. This is the first webinar of the program Rethinking Diplomacy, uh, which we have been running for a year. Uh, a year ago, we started uh, with Ambassador Pearson delivering the inaugural uh, lecture for the program. So we are extremely delighted and honored to have him back uh, a, to deliver another lecture on uh, a different topic that is uh, certainly part of his uh, expertise, Turkey's ambitions and American interests. Uh, today, uh, Mike Schoenfeld, our Vice President for Public Affairs and Government Relations at Duke University, will moderate. So uh, Mike Schoenfeld will introduce uh, Ambassador Pearson. And uh, I would like to say thank you to all those who have been involved in preparing this, this first webinar and to the Trent Foundation for their support uh, uh, of the program. Thank you, and uh, we hope to see you in uh, future uh, webinars. You will get uh, invitations, so please stay tuned. And uh, Mike, uh, please. And oh, sorry, just one uh, thing. Uh, for questions during and after um, uh, Ambassador Pearson's presentation, use the Q&A function. Thank you, and welcome to uh, the first event. Great, thank you, Giovanni. And uh, let me welcome uh, uh, all of you again on behalf of Duke University and, uh, and uh, express my appreciation for you joining us um, for this, what will be a very interesting and informative conversation. Uh, to tourists, um, and that, that includes, I'm sure many uh, on the line, Turkey is a magical crossroads of the world. It's where East meets West. But of course, it is also an important, if not an essential geopolitical player um, with uh, connections, with influence, with impact, um, uh, ex uh, exhibiting both impact and influence and being impacted and influenced by uh, Europe, by Asia, by China, by uh, Iran, Iraq, Syria, um, uh, uh, Russia, and, uh, and many other locations and many other geopolitical players around the world. Today, we are going to explore Turkey's history, its ambitions, the challenges of a new environment, a new geopolitical environment, and the implications for both US foreign policy and for Turkish-US relations, particularly at a time of transition in both countries and a time of great ferment in both countries. And we are going to do that by having a conversation with one of the most distinguished diplomats of the modern era, Ambassador Robert Pearson. Uh, uh, Ambassador Pearson is currently a fellow at Duke University's Center for International and Global Studies Rethinking Diplomacy Program. His uh, experience at the State Department is deep and broad. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Turkey. He served as the Director General of the U.S. Foreign Service, the Deputy Chief of Mission to France, the Deputy Permanent Representative to the U.S. Mission at NATO, uh, and the chair of NATO's political committee. Uh, he is also currently a, a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute in Washington, the president, <clears throat> excuse me, and the president of American Publishers, which publishes a journal on American foreign policy and diplomacy through the University of North Carolina. Um, a reminder, uh, as Giovanni said, please put your questions in the Q&A and we will get to as many of them as we can following Ambassador Pearson's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ambassador Robert Pearson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure to be with you all today, and I'm looking forward to this discussion and uh, time for questions and answers. Uh, this is a very nuanced and complicated relationship between the United States and Turkey, and so I will necessarily have to hit highlights but I would be very happy to listen to your questions and comments uh, afterwards. So um, the, uh, I'm gonna show you a series of uh, maps to begin with and talk through them. And so let's start with the uh, first map. This is a, a map of uh, the uh, Central Asia, the Western part of Central Asia. 
And uh, we're going to show you where the Turks, according to their own story, originated in Central Asia, near where the uh, borders of Russia, uh, Kazakhstan, and uh, China and Mongolia meet in that circle. Somewhere in the current era, or perhaps uh, a few centuries afterwards, uh, Turkic tribes began to move down the rich river valleys, Tashkent, uh, Dushanbe, uh, into uh, Afghanistan, and also into uh, then Persia. Uh, when they reached uh, Persia, they were converted to Islam, and they began to uh, become uh, soldiers in the armies of the Arabs. Uh, the Turks are not Arabs. They are uh, obviously a Central Asian um, uh, origin uh, people. And then they became generals in uh, Arab armies. And then they moved into the peninsula of uh, Anatolia and out toward the Caspian. And in the uh, 13th century, um, I, you see the movement of the tribes. In the 13th century, uh, they actually moved into Europe so that from a Turkish standpoint, the uh, Turks have been a European nation since the 1300s, uh, the 14th century. So they claim European citizenship, if you will, for over seven centuries. I think that's important. There are two other things that are kind of interesting. One is that the Turks were never conquered by the Arabs. Uh, they retained their ethnic identity through a long period of time. So when you think about the progress of the Turkish tribes and people from the beginning to the end, we're talking about six or 700 years uh, crossing uh, South uh, Central uh, Asia into the Middle East and through the Middle East into Europe. So their transition was not a sudden invasion and occupation. It was a very slow, gradual accumulation of power and geography uh, before they took uh, Constantinople in 1453 and renamed it uh, Istanbul. Show the next slide, please. If Mr. Erdogan dreams, he might dream of this map. This map shows the furthest extent of the Ottoman Empire. From Istanbul in the center there on the Black Sea, the Turks moved northwest and were at the gates of Vienna twice in the 17th century. I would say 60 or 75 years after taking Istanbul, the Turks moved south uh, east and then uh, west to uh, take the uh, Arab countries uh, over as colonies and they were the colonial masters of the Arab countries for about three and a half centuries. The, the extent of uh, Turkey and the Ottoman Empire was from Vienna to the Indian Ocean, from the Caspian Sea to near the Atlantic. So this is an empire that lasted for uh, uh, 500 years and which has a rich history and left, uh, of course, an enormous influence in all the territories that it occupied. And so it would be natural for Mr. Erdogan to think of Turkey as having ties to Central Asia, to Europe, to the Middle East, uh, and to the Mediterranean, where, of course, the Turks had a uh, formidable force. Next slide, please. If you were to place the map of Turkey onto the United States, you could place the eastern edge of uh, Turkey out in the mountains to the right in your screen uh, on the Delaware shore. And you would place the western edge of Turkey uh, on, in the suburbs of Kansas City, Missouri. The, uh, you'll also note that the islands just offshore from Turkey are Greek islands. Lesbos, which today is a major refugee center, is only three miles from the Turkish coast. North to south, uh, about the distance from the Ohio River uh, at the Kentucky level, I'll call it uh, Illinois level, up to the border of Canada. So a huge country, 84 million people, highly educated, um, very disciplined, and by the year 2030, they probably will be 90 million Turks. So an, an important uh, country and culture and as uh, Michael Schoenfeld said, a, crossroad, a crossroads for 
uh, global civilization uh, for centuries and centuries. So uh, thank you and you can, uh, uh, okay, excellent. So what I wanna talk about right now is Erdogan the man for just a moment. He is a, he grew up in a um, blue collar neighborhood in Istanbul, a little bit like South Philly in the old days or, or Oakland, something like that, but a rough and tumble neighborhood where his charisma, his physical strength, his athletic ability uh, made him a natural leader. He is a devotee of the Muslim Brotherhood ideology, which is a simple ideology, an anti-colonialist colonialist anti, um, ideology. And that is composed basically of three simple principles that every Muslim deserves a good life, that uh, he or she can achieve that good life through Islam, and three, only if Islam is independent. And therefore, uh, Mr. Erdogan believes in the power of the community, the Ummah, to uh, select a leader. And once selected, himself, for example, he considers that he has complete power over the political and economic, and to a great extent, the cultural and educational life of uh, Turkey. He thinks that Western ideas like separation of powers and independent uh, authorities for institutions uh, just brings chaos, is uh, anti-Islamic, uh, and is a Western graft on, uh, on uh, Turkey's uh, long history. He <clears throat> has uh, a... Um, interesting theory of uh, diplomacy. He thinks of Turkey as being a, a victim. So if you think very long term, he is thinking of a glorious past, an unfortunate present, and a glorious future. He thinks of Turkey as being morally superior, uh, but is often treated as a victim. When the Turks negotiate, Obviously they identify the problem, but they generally expect the party across the other side of the table to come up with a solution. Now Americans think and often go into a negotiation with a solution that isn't perfect. Or they want the other side to react to it. They're, they're looking for what we call the win-win uh, kind of solution in negotiations, but that's not the way the Turks operate. Uh, their theory is that if they were right to begin with, why should they change their position. So this uh, combination of victim and requiring the other side to come up with a solution has worked very effectively at times for Turkey. And uh, this is something you'll see in today's news or next week's news coming from Mr. Erdogan's uh, lips or from the Turkish Foreign Ministry's uh, response to uh, issues. So in general, he thinks that Turkey does not have its proper place in the world and it deserves a much bigger role. As far back as 2016, he uh, on a trip to Greece said that the treaty that ended World War I that gave uh, Greece uh, sovereignty over the islands in the Aegean uh, had to be renegotiated. He wants some control over the seabed uh, in the Aegean Sea. He wants control over a large margin of territory in Syria, south of the Turkish border uh, to, for economic reasons and to uh, control the Kurds in his opinion. And he thinks that is a natural extension of the power uh, of Turkey. He has said that uh, Turkey was imprisoned by the peace treaty that ended uh, World War I. He has pan-Turkic ambitions uh, Turks like to think that one day uh, Turkic speak, speaking people from uh, Turkey all the way up to Central Asia could uh, reunite. That's why he plays so uh, assertively to Turkish populations in Germany and elsewhere in Europe. He feels that that's a natural right uh, uh, that uh, Turkey has with respect to populations of Turks in other countries. As far back as 2018, uh, Mr. Erdogan in the UN uh, said that Turkey, that the world was bigger than five. Now, what he said at the time was that there ought to be 20 permanent members of the Security Council, that it wasn't fair or right 
or effective to have five countries, as he said, one Asian, uh, uh, three Europeans, and one North American country deciding the fate of the world. But it's clear that he's thinking of the G20 as a kind of configuration, and we'll, we'll come back to that later. But he also sees Turkey as one of those permanent members of the UN Security Council and uh, playing both a political role and a religious role as a representative of the Islamic world uh, in that capacity. He's never taken this theory farther, but the, the implication of the world is bigger than five is that medium level powers should play a larger role in the world governance and that the UN Security Council should include a permanent member that would of course uh, mean Turkey as well. He has a very ambitious defense uh, plan for Turkey. Um, he is building a main battle tank. Turkey already builds warships. Turkey just acquired five new high-grade submarines to add to its submarine fleet that would give submarines an offensive capability the way our submarines have an offensive capability by firing uh, cruise missiles into uh, territory that where we want to exert influence. Turkey is a world leader in drone technology, as I think maybe many of you already know. And Turkey is uh, a year or two away from completing an, ambi an um, amphibious assault vessel that has a hull large enough to be converted to a small aircraft carrier, uh, one similar to a, a carrier that Spain uh, already has. He wants to wean Turkey off the US, dependence off the US and German and Israeli technology. And that is one of his major goals in expanding Turkey's defense capability. Back in 2018, uh, Turkey created a Turkish space agency. Uh, they are developing by their own statements, a laser guided ship to ship or surface to surface missile quote for overseas operations unquote, according to Turkish authorities, um, anti-ship missiles. And it also is uh, building a ballistic missile capability so that Turkey would have an independent launch capability. These are goals that most Americans have not heard about, but the Turks have not made any secret of it. This is what they published and this is what they've said. So uh, at this point, uh, could we uh, share the uh, screen again, please, and the fourth map. I'm going to fill this map in. I want most people think of the Middle East in terms of land territory, but what I want to show you this uh, this afternoon is the uh, seas that surround the Middle East. So um, the Turks obviously have a presence in the Black Sea. They have a presence in the Aegean Sea. They have a presence in the Mediterranean. Uh, I've also uh, put uh, signifiers in the Red Sea and in the uh, Arabian Sea and in the Persian Gulf and uh, one in the Caspian. Now, Turkey has a base in Sudan. It has a base in uh, Qatar, which is well known. And it has a base in Somalia. Turkey's aim, its strategic aim, is to have a substantial naval presence in what it called the three seas, that's the ones surrounding the uh, peninsula of, uh, of Anatolia, Black Sea, Aegean, and Mediterranean. But it has also extended its influence into the Black Sea and to the Persian Gulf. And with the recent conflict in uh, Azerbaijan, between Azerbaijan and Armenia, Turkey received agreement to build a land corridor from its Eastern border through an uh, Azeri enclave about 25 miles across the Southern uh, part of Armenia into Azerbaijan and the Turks at least in media terms, have become quite excited about this and said that Turkey now can go all the way to China. So if you're thinking in uh, geographic, geopolitical terms, you can see that here are seven seas 
uh, that Turkey considers itself to have an interest in and where it has, has or will have anticipates a presence. So there isn't any other state in the Middle East with this kind of um, strategy and this kind of assertive presence at the moment. Well, thank you very much if you would leave screen sharing. That means that um, uh, Turkey sees an opportunity for itself in the future years and decades that also plays off the impact of the COVID crisis. Uh, Mr. Erdogan has criticized what he calls the world governance. You, you'll recall his uh, world is bigger than five speech at the UN in 2018. And he says that uh, the liberal democracies and the world order that existed until COVID broke out actually produced the chaos that resulted. And he points out that the UN did not play an effective role. The WHO did not play an effective role. That uh, the G20 did not play an effective role. And so his argument is that now it's time for middle powers uh, to play a more effective role regionally of course, he has Turkey in mind for the Middle East, but other countries in mind around the world, Thailand or Mexico, to play a stronger regional role uh, in a new, what he calls emerging globe order. So he sees an opportunity to um, relatively expand Turkish influence as from his standpoint, he sees the American impact lessening uh, in the Middle East. So let me just touch very briefly on some uh, points that uh, are challenges for the Turks. First, the Eastern Med. Turkey's basic complaint, and they have a point, is that they have the longest coastline in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean, but they have the least access to its resources. Greece claims a 200 mile zone from all of its islands. The um, Greeks, Israelis, and Cypriots have announced plans to build a gas pipeline from the far eastern part of the eastern Mediterranean to Europe. Greece and Egypt have signed an agreement to share um, research and technology for the area of the Mediterranean between those two countries. If you uh, looked at a map, you would see that uh, Greece is just barely west of Egypt. So it's almost a straight line north and south across a huge swath of the Mediterranean. That agreement was signed in August. And Turkey has extended its claim for uh, resources in the Middle East out to the midline of the Eastern Mediterranean where it meets the Libyan assertion of access to resources out to the middle line. So Turkey claims waters and, 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 uh, floor and sea floor that is also claimed by Greece and in the farthest part of the Eastern Mediterranean also claimed by Cyprus. And Turkey has used the existence of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus to claim resources to the east part of the island of Cyprus and to the southern part of the island of Cyprus. These are not claims that Turkey can succeed in having uh, alone, but Turkey's diplomatic approach often is, if it can't be a part of the solution, it can make sure that everyone understands it has to be a part of the game, that it can spoil the, uh, the game if it wants to do so. And Turkey relies on the law of the sea treaties uh, absence in solving this problem as its reason for objecting to the current allocation of resources. It did not sign the law of the treaty and it said that the treaty was unfair as far back as 1980 and that's still its consistent uh, policy. In Syria, the Turks have gained nothing strategically. The Russians have given them nothing. But there again, Turkey is there to exert influence and to be a part of the final settlement that is relying on mercenaries, uh, many of whom have Al-Qaeda direct connections, uh, but it's using that territory as a bargaining chip and it also uses it to try to control the Kurds 
although the Russians have good relations with the Kurds and do the patrols with the Turks. And so the Russians have an interest in Syria with respect to protecting the Kurds uh, that the uh, Turks object to. In Libya, Turkey has supported the uh, government in Tripoli, which is a Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, based government, but it is a UN recognized government, but it doesn't have the capability to uh, move into the eastern part of the country where the vast amount of the oil fields are. And that uh, geography is supported by Russia, by the United Arab Emirates, by Egypt, and by France. So there again, Turkey has a stake in the game, but it's not able to dominate the solution. With respect to the European Union, I would say quite honestly that uh, membership in the European Union is a dead letter for now and for the foreseeable future. Both parties keep open the idea that it could be possible, uh, but essentially in the last few years, they've made no progress whatsoever. And I don't see any prospect for them continuing to do so. Yet Turkey depends on the Europeans market, it depends on the Europeans to provide it funds for its refugees. And, it, and Mr. Erdogan enjoys the prestige conversations that he has with Angela Merkel uh, and with others uh, in Europe as an equal and a power to be uh, reckoned with. NATO is very important for Turkey as a prestige symbol. It is the only European wide organization in which the Turks have an equal seat and equal authority. And while they have acted contrary to NATO principles, as far as the Americans are concerned and, and others as well are concerned, uh, they believe that uh, their membership to, in NATO is very important. And I don't see any possibility that they would voluntarily uh, leave uh, that alliance. So one of the major issues that Mr. Erdogan is facing is that these military gambits, war in uh, Azerbaijan, war in Syria, war in Libya, these military gambits have a relatively short term horizon unless they produce diplomatic or political gains. He has an economy, he must have an economy so, to sustain these overseas ambitions and uh, there's a difficulty there. Uh, and uh, uh, the Turkish people themselves are growing tired of a presidential political system which controls all aspects of the country's political and economic and cultural affairs. He's promised reforms, Mr. Erdogan has, uh, but uh, his essential partner in the parliament so far is blocking any of those reforms. So looking at Turkey overall, I would say that Turkey lacks the economic strength to command the political clout that Mr. Erdogan is trying to seek. The economy has high unemployment, there's a very heavy debt load. Uh, Turkey can't grow fast enough to catch up with the advanced uh, uh, countries. But like Venezuela, in this sense, uh, the collapse of the economy is not likely to collapse the Turkish government, in my opinion. Um, the Turks are very resilient people and uh, they uh, will bear up as long as they possibly can, but they are unhappy and they have let that unhappiness show uh, at the ballot box. So the government is running out of energy in a certain timeline, but that timeline is very uncertain. And Mr. Erdogan has three years before he has to uh, call elections again. So he is hoping that something will happen in that three year period that will turn the odds in his favor and that he will be able to have a majority in the parliament of his own party, if that's possible. And if so, he will be able to uh, restore his power and influence domestically as well. In this period in which we are transitioning in the American uh, administrations and Turkey is looking at the way the world has changed because of the change in the American administration and other factors, Turkey is already reaching out to try to improve relations uh, with other countries. It announced this week, for example, that, uh, the, that, that uh, Greek-Turkish talks will commence, I think, on January 25, 
And so this is a clear move by Turkey to deflect uh, criticism uh, of it and its role in the Eastern Mediterranean and to give the semblance of, being, of having a willingness to address some of these issues. Uh, we'll have to see what happens, but it's certainly better than not talking and it is a sign of Turkey's adjustment to the changes in the US administration and in the Middle East. Uh, it's very happy with the lifting of sanctions on Qatar uh, this last week, since it was an ally of Qatar for the three years in which sanctions applied. It feels vindicated by that. It has <clears throat> put out feelers to Israel, which Israel has not picked up on and which Turkey, you could say, didn't handle uh, all that well. It has begun talks with the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, here again, uh, uh, perhaps a relationship that is convenient, but nevertheless, Turkey is preparing itself to have some allies in case it comes under increased pressure, uh, worried about what happens when the new administration uh, takes power. I would say, however, that I think most of these are tactical changes. They're not strategic changes, but it does show that Turkish uh, diplomacy is, uh, is adjusting. So rethinking diplomacy has three major components. And this is part of our program at Duke to explain and try to promote a new way of looking at things in diplomatic terms. One, it has to involve all the stakeholders, cultural, economic, political, and military. And secondly, you start with the easiest issues first, the shared issues. If you do a Venn diagram, you put those issues in that common space and you start there. And thirdly, and very importantly, everyone involved in that process has to be committed to a solution. So the US interest is in, of course, a strong and prosperous Turkey, but not in the conditions that presently exist. So our approach I recommend would be one of patience and persistent use of our strengths. Turkey is not a strategic enemy of the United States. Uh, and therefore, since democracy and democratic elements are alive in Turkey, there's an opportunity to move forward. Uh, we might take Turkey's non-aligned stance, if I can call it that, as an opportunity. We will act in our interest and Turkey will act in, in, his interest, in its interest. There's no reason to kick Turkey out of NATO or try. The treaty does not have a kick out clause like the European Union does. Um, the Turks can't turn the situation in their favor strategically with their current approach. And there's a huge contradiction over the S-400 missile system. Turkey argues that it's no threat to the alliance based in Turkey, but in Kaliningrad, which is several hundred miles to the Northwest, those Russian batteries of S-400 missiles are directly aimed and threatened the Baltic States, Germany, Denmark, and Norway. So this question has never really been a uh, approached in that way with Turkey. And it would be interesting to, interesting to see how they explain this uh, contradiction uh, in their own uh, thinking about the S-400. And of course, the F-35 uh, fighter uh, aircraft cannot be deployed in Turkey as long as that missile system exists. It would be a global strategic risk for us to do so. So I would say, let's leave the current sanctions in place. Now they're mild, but they bite more deeply as time goes along. And this would be an incentive for the Turks to, uh, to, to negotiate. Um, the, a, a harsh reaction against the Turks would drive them into the arms of the Russians or the Chinese. So I think that we have about the right tenor of the sanctions set with Turkey. We hope it promotes uh, uh, a, a better dialogue. We should go back to talking about values. Uh, President-elect Biden's discussion of democracy and Mr. Trump's discussion of democracy are two entirely different things. So there's room for track two discussions. There's room for parliamentary groups to exchange visits. There's a great deal of room for the use of soft power. The Turks are great jazz players. They have a wonderful jazz tradition. And that would be one thing that could be done that everybody would enjoy. In film, in art, in textiles, the Turks have a world reputation that we could uh, enhance and work with. 
and for those NGO organizations that might be watching, uh, when I worked with IREX, we would take um, NGO experts from a given country and bring them to a city in uh, the US where the same problem existed to get a cross-cultural exchange of experience. And we would do the same with the country that was sending people to the US. So uh, that's something I don't know has, whether that is possible or has been organized with Turkey, but if it were, then I think both sides could uh, learn from their experiences and help their overall relationship. The power of the economies, US economy uh, and the European economy together are more than 50% or nearly 50% of the world's GNP. The Russian economy is half the size of California's. So in economic terms, we are the draw for decades to come for the growth of the Turkish economy. And we can use that to our uh, benefit. Um, Russia will be a problem for Turkey, as well as for the United States. So I think there'll be opportunities for us to work with the Turks to deal with problems that the Russians cause in the Middle East. I don't mean that we'll be partners, but I believe that the same problems may affect them that affect us sometimes. And we should use that opportunity to work with them. We should also use our relations with Egypt and the UAE and Iraq and, uh, and Saudi Arabia when uh, we would like to see uh, less assertive Turkish diplomacy in the Middle East. These countries are not interested in the Muslim Brotherhood theology, and they're not interested in having a former colonial master tell them what to do or how to guide their own choices. So I think they are natural allies uh, in the cases where we uh, need to look for them. So I've tried to outline a number of options for built for common ground and for building on common ground. The key point of this is that this requires an equal commitment from Turkey and from the United States. It can't be the United States trying to do a favor for Turkey in order to induce Turkey to agree to something that we do. That's not the way Turkish diplomacy works. In Turkish diplomacy, you do the favor after the deal is over to show that you're really good friends and it's really worthwhile doing it. You don't do the favor to get started on the conversation. So I think that the approach I've outlined, which is uh, to uh, act on our own interest, to act on a basis of equality, but to keep the door open for discussion and to expand the discussion in a number of ways, uh, protects our flexibility and also protects our interest and, and opens the door to greater collaboration with Turkey. So thank you for your attention and I'd be very happy to answer any questions or respond to uh, comments. Great, um, um, Ambassador Pearson, thank you very much. We, just as a reminder, we have the Q&A uh, function that is open. We have a number of questions there uh, that have come in. So we will try to get to um, as many as possible. Uh, let me start with, a. Uh, I wanna go back to one of the things that you had um, uh, led off with, which was the clearly the ambition and the desire of Turkey to be a um, leader in defense technology um, and in weapons technology. Um, there have been, I understand, there have been some questions um, coming out of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, and the, um, uh, at least some of the assertions that Azerbaijan uh, was, has been using Turkish technology, has been using um, American technology uh, and, and others. Um, do you see, do you think that this uh, is a uh, portent of an expansion of Turkey as a even more significant provider, of, a global provider of defense technology and arms? Well, I, they already have an active overseas market in what I would call the lighter end of defense technology, uh, trucks, uh, uh, armored vehicles, small light armored vehicles, and so on. So absolutely, they see this foreign exchange earning possibility is a real opportunity for them. And they are building to make themselves one, they say, one of the top 10 defense exporters in the world. This is not exactly grounded in today's reality, but this is what uh, we've heard Turks talk about. The uh, Turks did have massive, I'll call them massive, but large exercises with the Azeri uh, army uh, back in August. They clearly prepared them for the invasion and the incursion. They clearly gave them a sense of confidence 
about doing it and, uh, and they uh, claim credit for it. So uh, they used the pan-Turkic tie to accentuate the importance for Turkish nationalism. Uh, as you may remember, they called uh, the Azeris one, uh, two states, one nation. So uh, this means that at least in the Caucasus, Turkey plans to have an influential role and they hope to be able to reach energy resources in Central Asia through the Caspian that would avoid them having to do so through the current pipeline that runs through uh, Georgia as well. And so I would say, yes, uh, that's what the Turks plan to do in the future. Uh, so you had mentioned earlier, and it's been widely reported that Turkey is using the Chinese vaccine for the Chinese uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, is that an indication or could it be an indication of a broader relationship uh, coming up? Um, should we be looking at Turkish-Chinese um, relations as, a, uh, as an area of both interest and concern? Well, yes, I think the Chinese are quite interested in moving into uh, what I'm gonna call Western Central Asia, but uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, of course, uh, is a rail connection from China to Europe and uh, by overland. And so uh, this is something the Chinese are quite interested in. And they offer soft loans to uh, gain uh, supporters. Some of those have run into uh, a lot of trouble, but the Chinese have a strategy for moving into that area. And they have a strategy for obviously moving into various markets. One of the problems, there are two problems for Turkey, three problems really. One is that Chinese goods sell for less on the Turkish market than Turkish goods do. And so this isn't really helping the Turkish economy. Uh, secondly, the uh, uh, Chinese are talking about having some sort of presence in the Black Sea. Uh, this is already a topic for conversation and uh, the Chinese would have a right to send ships into the Black Sea under the Montreux Convention in peacetime if they wish to do so. And so that is, uh, a matter of interest to them. And then of course, there is the uh, Urumqi issue. The, uh, the, uh, the Uyghurs are the uh, most uh, persecuted Islamic minority in the world today, a million Uyghurs in Northwest China. And Turkey's government is absolutely silent on this issue while criticizing European treatment of, of, um, of Muslims and so on at a very high decibel level. They say absolutely nothing about uh, the uh, Uyghurs in Northwest China in concentration camps. So there's a real contradiction there that will play back into Turkish domestic politics and will have some uh, role in uh, lessening the uh, attraction of China to Turkey. But yes, the Turks are exploring this. It's an alternative to the West. Mr. Erdogan likes to find alternatives to the West. He likes to thumb his nose at uh, the Americans and the Europeans if there's an opportunity to do so. Um, thank you. We, we've got some great questions uh, and some very intriguing questions in the, in the Q&A. So let me uh, refer one from Philip Jones. Uh, and that is, how successful has Turkey been in reducing Islamic terrorist, terrorism inside Turkey? That is um, an excellent question. You know, uh, the Turks in the American view did not treat ISIS as a significant threat early enough. But the Turks have had long, long experience with domestic terrorists in Turkey. They're not related at all to ISIS or the current uh, 21st century terrorism. And uh, they, are, they have been very effective at controlling uh, most of that. They, so they, they have a multiple front of dealing with the terrorism. But I would say that in historical terms, one of the most difficult conversations that the United States has ever had with Turkey and Turkey with the United States was how to deal with ISIS. And uh, I say that uh, there is still some speculation that Turkey has not been as opposed to ISIS as certainly Americans would like it to have been. Uh, question from Renee Earl, and I actually want to add on to it. Um, question from Renee is, is the U.S. using its soft or softish power 
to address corruption and educational freedom in Turkey. And then I'd like to add on also, um, you, you talked about Turkish soft power, um, which has man manifested itself through uh, very popular television shows, but at the same time with um, some very real challenges on academic and, and, and um, uh, clampdowns on academic freedom that in, in the universities that might make it uh, a little contradictory. Can you, can you talk about both the soft power coming in and the soft power going out? Yeah, so that's an excellent question, <laughs> really an excellent question. And the truth is that uh, we have as a standard part of the portfolio of American diplomacy with Turkey, uh, talked about corruption for a long time. We work on drug trafficking, human trafficking, um, uh, all of those issues to the extent that uh, we can. And I'm sure that that will remain on the agenda. The, um, um, the issue of education is a very, uh, volatile one. And of course, the United States is very unhappy with the way the Turks have uh, politically dominated the educational system in Turkey. And there's a very recent example in which uh, Mr. Erdogan appointed a political um, loyalist to head up Turkey's most prestigious university, the Harvard of Turkey. And so this has generated real response and real uh, resistance. But it's consistent with Mr. Erdogan's theory that having been elected president, he has the power to do these sorts of things. So uh, it, the fight for America and for those in Turkey who believe in democracy is the, the long fight to try to maintain the principle of open education and to find opportunities to uh, take advantage of it. But uh, at least on education, it's gonna be a very difficult fight. I would say on the on the uh, soft power that the U.S. could offer, that I think there's enormous scope for exchanges with Turkey that have not been fully taken advantage of in the performing arts, uh, in the visual arts, and in exchanges of experts on social problems uh, that are not political. So if you're dealing with uh, uh, medical issues or if you're dealing with uh, uh, other issues that are socially important, but not politically sensitive, I think there's a large scope of things that could be done there. And I personally would like to see more emphasis publicly be given to that kind of exchange because it would help the overall tone of the relationship. Uh, question from Vivian Taylor. How much thought has been given to the idea of supporting an independent Kurdistan as a way of protecting the Kurd civil rights and limiting Turkey's power? That's another very good question. Here's the problem. Uh, an independent Kurdistan would probably generate claims for territory in Turkey uh, and in Iran and in Syria and in Iraq. And so all four of those countries are adamantly opposed to an independent Kurdish state. Moreover, an independent Kurdish state would have no access to the outside world without the permission of one of those neighboring states. It, has, it is totally landlocked, mainly where the Kurds are living today. It couldn't ship a good, it couldn't fly a plane, it couldn't do anything unless one of the neighboring states agreed. So my own experience, which isn't perfect, would be that the Kurds work for the kind of autonomy they are seeking and relationships with the surrounding countries that are that support their existence and their cultural and linguistic freedom and to the extent possible their political autonomy but that independence for a Kurdistan is probably a bridge too far. So a um, somewhat perhaps related question from Walter Colton can uh, Biden, the Biden administration, can the Biden administration negotiate peace in Syria with Russia, Turkey, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, and Iran, and possibly Israel? Uh, is there a way to cobble this together for the benefit of the region and the planet? Well, um, I would say first of all, the um, size of the American presence in Syria today, following the um, substantial reduction of forces uh, under President Trump is too small 
to play a very influential role in the settlement of Syria. It doesn't mean that we don't have a voice. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be talking about it. But in terms of leverage, we don't have the leverage that we could have had, perhaps should have had in solving this problem. The, um, I don't know that um, the Israelis are very interested in trying to solve the problem of Syria at this point. I don't mean to be negative about the Israelis. It's just that a weak Syria is a weak Syria and not a threat uh, to Israel. And the Israeli concern in uh, Syria at the moment is Iran. And it's, it should be our concern and Turkey's concern as well. But it is really an Israeli uh, concern. I think that the process of finding peace in Syria is going to take years and years. Uh, I mean, at the moment, we can't even decide what kind of economic reconstruction funds should go to Syria and under what conditions. And uh, the idea of turning over billions of American dollars to um, the Syrian government for their control and allocation is completely unacceptable. And there doesn't seem to be any other avenue at the moment. So I feel very badly about Syria. I would have been very much in favor of a reaction by the United States in 2013 to the Syrian use of chemical weapons against innocent people in Aleppo, but it didn't happen. And we have to deal with today the way that today exists. So I, I don't see a good solution right at the moment uh, that would be concretely be able to be put in place in the near future. Um, thank you. And, and just a reminder, um, we have a few more minutes. So please, uh, if you do have questions, drop them into the chat, uh, into the Q&A, excuse me. This is from uh, Dave Sidor. Um, what is the status and the strength of Kemalism and of secularism in Turkey? Uh, I would separate these two. Secularism is very strong. Democracy is very strong. Kemalism is associated with the idea that a Western educated elite was entitled to run the country because it knew better how to lead Turkey forward. I think that idea is done, it's over. But there are millions of Turks who are Democrats in the small d uh, definition, who know what democracy could produce and who want a country that is governed by the choice of individual people, uh, which is the core principle of democracy, and by the rule of law, which is the core principle of constitutionalism, and they will not give up. The Turks are very resilient, as I mentioned before. Uh, they can be very stubborn, and these millions of Turks are not giving up on the dream that democracy could return, and they still have the ballot box. But I think that if they were to win and defeat Mr. Erdogan and his government, they would then face a really enormous challenge of how to move forward with their democratic principles uh, in a post Erdogan era. So uh, democracy is alive and uh, vibrant in Turkey, but the future task for a democracy in Turkey uh, might be difficult. So um, let, let me ask a related question, that, the, a somewhat related question perhaps that, that's just come in. Uh, what is the implication of the conversion of the Hagia Sophia back into a mosque? Um, it's possible to judge this at several levels. One is that uh, Mr. Erdogan sees himself as a global leader of the Islamic faith, as someone who has in, entitled to speak for uh, on Islamic issues globally. Uh, and so taking over Hagia Sophia and making it a mosque is a um, commitment to that kind of global, um, that kind of global uh, presence. On a second level, it is putting a finger in the eye of Westerners uh, who thought that it was a museum and considered it a museum and gloried in the fact that it was one of the world's most magnificent structures. And thirdly, um, it's a uh, poke in the eye at the uh, secularist in Turkey. 
uh, to show that uh, the country, in his view, uh, should be more Islamic than uh, Western, and that this is a heritage that belongs uh, by right to Turkey, and he has demonstrated it. So uh, it did, he, he enjoyed uh, the consternation in the West over the conversion of Hagia Sophia into a, uh, into a mosque. And he seemed not to fully appreciate the fact that mosques are operating in Western Europe, but this magnificent edifice built by a Christian Byzantine emperor uh, could not exist except as a mosque in Turkey. We have a couple of questions about the Golanist movement, um, both in Turkey, uh, the, the implications in Turkey, and also uh, as we have seen over the last uh, couple of years, the implications for US-Turkish relations. Um, could you uh, offer some, some thoughts on that perhaps? Yes, exactly. Um, uh, Mr. Gulen came to the United States in the early 90s, really uh, in agreement with the Turkish government. So it was not an escape to the United States. The Turkish government uh, supported his desire to immigrate to the United States. Uh, and so his status came here as a person who was not being sought by anybody, but, uh, but was acceptable. His uh, movement is a movement of, I would call it personal religious reform and behavior uh, that tries to hold itself out to be the highest standards of uh, integrity and so on. And he's founded a number of schools when Mr. Erdogan took power in 2002. It was the Gulenist experts, the highly educated, competent, business savvy experts who provided many of the civil servants to help that government run because Mr. Erdogan's own followers were not as involved uh, in the economy and the society as much as were uh, Mr. Gulen's. They fell out over the corruption charges in 2013 when Mr. Gulen uh, decided to expose the deep corruption in the uh, highest levels of the Turkish government. And uh, then again, with the attempted coup in 2015, Mr. Erdogan blamed Mr. Gulen for having instigated the coup. Uh, we have an extradition treaty with Turkey. Turkey was invited to provide evidence that evidence was never sufficient, I will have to say. Uh, some of the people who confessed that Mr. Gulen had organized the coup uh, appeared on camera with deep bruises on their faces and bodies. Um, so today, uh, it serves Mr. Erdogan's purpose well to use Mr. Gulen as a scapegoat for things that have gone wrong in the country. And he has purged I will say hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of people from his government for being Gulenist loyalists. And in Turkey, if you take the father's job away or the mother's job away, you take away income for almost the entire family. So then the son can't get a job at a company because the father has been purged. The children can't get education because the mother has been purged. And so it has um, ramifications through the whole society that actually lie at the sentiment we now hear from Turkey about a demand for reform in criminal justice and reform in the way the society treats uh, people who have different points of view. Uh, we're right at one o'clock and I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and uh, this is from uh, Abdusalam Magruri. For uh, calibrating sanctions to change Turkish state behavior, is there a model elsewhere to follow to achieve the desired objectives? The honest answer is no. Sanctions are a two-edged sword. You, the, the sanctioned country clearly doesn't like being sanctioned. The effective use of sanctions is to stimulate a conversation intending to remove the sanctions in place of better behavior. So it depends on the country. It depends on the circumstances. It depends on what's being sanctioned. I think that's why the American sanctions were, one of the reasons why the American sanctions were as mild as they are. The sanctions apply only to the purchase of this missile system by the Turks. 
The Turks are free to buy American military equipment on the open market. Uh, they can't use American loans to do so. They can't use international financial institution loans to do so. They can't use XM bank loans to do so, but they can import American military equipment if they want to. The incentive in the sanctions on Turkey is that last year, Turkey's purchases of foreign military equipment was 40% American. And so while these sanctions are quite mild at the moment, in the years that are coming, they will become more and more difficult. And I think that's a nice way to say to the Turks, here's an incentive to avoid this harm. Let us make this deal before things get worse. And, uh, but back to your basic fundamental question, the kinds of sanctions you apply always depend upon the particular circumstances and the particular goal and the particular type of activity that you're trying to uh, prevent. Uh, Ambassador Pearson, thank you. Uh, I, we, we have a number more questions and I'm sorry we don't have more time to, uh, to go through this, but on behalf of Duke uh, and the Rethinking Diplomacy Project, I wanna say thank you very much uh, for a um, wonderful tour de raison of, uh, of Turk, modern Turkey uh, and Turkish, US Turkish relations. Uh, and uh, to those who have been watching and listening, thank you very, very much for joining us today. And I'd now like to turn it over to uh, Giovanni Zinalda for some concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mike. And thank you, uh, Ambassador Pearson. This has been a great. Uh, event and uh, we would like to thank again all the participants and uh, uh, we will send a thank you note to all the part participants including uh, some uh, feed, uh, some uh, articles on this event so stay tuned and uh, thank you again to the do 16 and uh, and duke university uh, for allowing us to have this event thank you and uh, have a nice uh, day <laughs>